tonight. We're glad you're here. We're going to jump into our regular midweek Bible study. Got a good number out. We appreciate I lost that. You. you lost me? I lost you. Uh, Uh, how about now? There we go. Man, I really don't. Okay, well let's just see. Let's just see where we are. Uh, all right. Uh, I I may cut out again, Miss Sandra. If I do, I I just yell. Okay, I'm good at that. So. Uh, I used to, uh, I, I come from a religious, I did, I did a plenty of, of preaching in, at the top of my lungs, so do what, uh, I don't understand, never mind, okay, uh, sometimes when you're up here, people, how do you feel like, oh, signals, and I don't really know what I'm doing, but, uh, so, anyway, uh, Let's jump into our book. That's what we're going to be studying here in the Lord's Church. I wanted to back up real quick, kind of let you know, uh, this book is a very simple book, okay? Uh, and I know it's kind of hard because we've been studying like Revelation, like in, you know, like a, uh, apocalyptic, deep, theological, eschatology, all them big words, deep stuff. We come right here and we're like, and we're, uh, we're just kind of, eating here. And I understand that the reason behind that is because there is a need for all kind of teaching. There's time, time to be very deep and, 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 and theological, and there's other times back to some very elementary things and take our and And it's very easy for me to say, well, I don't understand why we need to go back to the simple things. I mean, why, why can't, uh, why, why, don't they, why don't people understand that? Um, why don't people understand how to explain premillennialism and postmillennialism? And why don't people understand how to uh, talk about a, a the, the penal substitute substitutionary atonement and all these big things? Here's here's the thing: not everybody's on the same level, and we need to understand that. And so sometimes we need to go back and and be very very basic. And so I don't want you to think I'm trying to insult your intelligence or, for the sake of this, just be. Uh, you know, uh, uneventful, but we, we need to talk about some of this. And so tonight, we're going to discuss some important things. Now, last week, we talked about the Lord's church. We Jesus did establish his church. We know that. He told Peter that I will build my church, Matthew 16 and 18. Um, and so we know Jesus built his church. Just for discussion, did, did Jesus, when did this church that Jesus said he would build come into existence? Anybody got an idea? Okay. The, the day of, do what? Yeah, okay. Okay, mate, yeah. Uh, he, he purchased uh, with his blood this, this uh, opportunity to have this church. And in Acts chapter 2, who stood up and preached the first gospel sermon? Peter did. Remember, he stood up at Pentecost and he preached the gospel. And uh, he gave the inaugural sermon after the Lord ascended into heaven. And what church came into existence that day? Jesus' church. It came into existence when the Holy Spirit came with great power and baptized all of those apostles in the Holy Spirit, and they that day uh, began to, to uh, speak with uh, miraculous tongues so that they could understand them, and it would be through the power of the Holy Spirit. They uh, began to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then Peter told them. Now, here's the thing. If the Lord has a church, and he's established it, does it make sense to you that now that I know he has a church, I want to be in that church? Does that make sense? If we should want to do that. And so the question actually is this. Well, how do we enter this church? So if you want to look with me tonight, let's look in Acts 2 for just a minute. That's where we're at in this book, entering the Lord's Church. Let's ask that question. Acts, the second chapter in the Word of God. Acts, the second chapter 
in God's Word. Many of you are very familiar with this text. So let me paraphrase real quick. Peter is preaching the gospel. He has told them that Jesus died, that he was raised, that he's ascended into heaven. And so look with me in Acts 2 and verse 37. Peter, well, actually, back up with me to verse 36. Acts 2 and verse 36. Listen to what Peter said to those people that day at Pentecost. He, and I'm reading from the King James. He said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same who? Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and what? Christ. Now when they heard this, when they heard what? What did they hear? The words Peter spoke, that he is Lord in Christ, they were pricked in their heart. What does that mean? They were touched. They were convicted by what they heard. It, 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 it resonated with them. You, you ever been told something and it just really just, uh, it, it hit you, it, it settled with you? Well, that's what happened. And they asked a question unto Peter. And again, I know this is elementary, but, but we, we need to walk through this. They asked a question and said, men and brethren, what did they ask? What shall we do? What, what shall we do about what? what? Their sinful condition leads us to death. Peter, what shall we do? Look at what Peter said. Now listen, I, I, and again, we're talking about entering the Lord's church. What does... What are some things that we hear people say that you need to do today to be saved? Okay, pray. Ask Jesus into your heart. Okay, sometimes people say that, right? Um, repent. These are all words that come together. Uh, what did Peter say? Well, look in verse 38. This is what Peter said to them. Repent and be what? baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ as a symbol, right? No. For what reason? For the what? The remission of sins. Or what is that word remission? The what? The for forgiveness of sins. So is baptism a part of having sins washed away? Well, sure it is. Does water wash it away? No. No, no, no. The blood of Jesus does when we obey him. And so when we're looking at our book in section 3 of Lesson 1, Entering the Lord's Church, uh, since the church belongs to Jesus, he has the right to decide who comes into it. Now, how does one come into the Lord's Church? Do we vote people into the church? No. We've never voted anybody in here. Why? Is it our church to vote people into? I don't have a church. I, don't, you, I imagine you don't have a church. It's his church. And how, who puts people in the church? The Lord does. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Look at that verse with me. Praise God and having favor with all the people and the who added to the church. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the Lord adds people to his one church. And that makes them what? Christians, right? And nothing more, nothing less. And so Jesus has the authority to tell us how to come into this church. Well, we know that we must hear the word of God again. I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm on page seven, section three, entering the Lord's church. This book's kind of convoluted when you start looking at how to, how it's lined up. Hearing and believing is essential. If I don't hear the gospel, I can't respond to the gospel, right? So you've got to hear it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Without what? One, please God, I almost said it. Without what? Faith, without faith. So the gospel must be heard, and it must be believed. Yes, sir. Yeah, what do we do? Yes. Yep. So, so now that word repentance is is not just saying, "Well, God, I'm sorry." 
But it is, God, I'm sorry, and I'm turning from where I am. I'm changing my direction. The, the word literally means to make a, a, an about face, a turn, because God commands everywhere to repent. And then we need to, after we repent, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Remember that Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8? He said, can I be baptized? And, uh, and Philip asked him, he said, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you may be baptized. And what did that eunuch say? I believe. He confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. In fact, Jesus said, whoever will confess me before men, I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Men confess unto what? Unto salvation. Confession is made. I believe that Jesus is God. Now having... What is the culminating act where Jesus adds one to the church? In baptism. In baptism. Uh, look with me in verse 41 of Acts 2. Acts 2 and verse 41. And again, let's remember, this is a class set. So if you've got a comment or a question, please ask it. There are no bad questions. None. We will talk about it. Acts 2 and 41. When they heard the gospel, then they that gladly received his word were what? They were what now? Baptized. And the same day, those people that were baptized were what? What are them three words? Unto them. Added unto them. Unto who? The church. So they heard the word, believed the word, and they were baptized. And when they were baptized, the Lord added them to his what? To his church. To his church. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus that a man must be born of water and of the Spirit. And so this is how we become a member of his church. We, uh, by virtue of being saved. Now, we're not going to get in tonight about identifying with a local congregation. There'll be a time for that, but this is, yes. Okay. No, so, so what, what, what he is saying is that we have to make our confession that we believe that Jesus is God's son. Yes. And, and, you know, just like when I baptize someone, I ask them, I ask you, do you believe Jesus is God's son? And we say yes. Then you, you're agreeing with that, and that's our confession. Yes. So that's what that's talking about. Um, and and then, then you can be baptized. That's the same way that P, uh, Philip dealt with the Ethiopian eunuch. So did you have Three days. Okay. He's been praying for three days. So many people will say, well, he's maybe. That's not what the text says. Mm -hmm. uh, the text tells us that a certain man named Ananias uh, and he come to me, this is Paul telling Paul telling the story later. Uh, he said that uh told him verse sixteen, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible defines it. Calling on the name of the Lord is what we do. That's right. Yeah, calling on the name of the Lord is not merely saying, Lord, save me. It is, the, it, is a, it is an obedient faith. If I told Sarah before we were married, years ago we would say this, I'm going to come calling what? On you. I'm going to come calling on you. Well, what, what did that mean? I'm going to go outside her house and say, Sarah, Sarah. No, I was going to go and knock and, and invite, and we were going to go. 
this idea of calling on the name of the Lord, as many people today say, well, just, just pray and ask Jesus into your heart. But nowhere in the New Testament do we ever find someone being told to pray and ask Jesus into their heart. And that's a very important truth. And we need to think about that because it's very sobering. What we do find over and over is they heard, they believed, and they were what? Baptized. That's right. The Corinthians, this Acts 10 and 47, Paul, Acts 22. I mean, it's just a repeating theme. Yes, sir, Brother Leonard. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Saul had saw Jesus face to face. He had been praying. So, so he, had a, he had an experience. He saw Jesus. He had been praying. So he was neither saved by his experience. He was neither saved in those three days he was praying. And Ananias came to him and said, Saul, you are still in your what? Sin. And here's how you need to be saved, Saul. Be baptized. Doing that, you appeal. In fact, Peter uses that word over in 1 Peter 3 and 21. You call on the name of the Lord. And he saves you. And he added Saul to the what? The church. Yes, Brother Mike. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. It's ongoing. It's, a con it's becoming more like Jesus every day. And so that's how we're added to this church. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, he taught that, uh, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of your great awakenings uh, in, in, your, in the uh, 19th and 20th century that were going on, they began to teach this, you know. Well, you don't have to be baptized. It's just, you just, you just ask the Lord into your heart. It was, it was very much so focused more on an experience, uh, you know, of sorts than it was uh, hearing the gospel and obeying the gospel. Yes, yeah, so you're exactly right. Is there any other thought before we move along? Well, let's look at lesson two. There's going to be more to say about uh, some of the baptism and other things later, but let's look at lesson two, the origin of the Lord's church. When we use, what does the word origin mean? Just what are some synonyms? I was going to say synonyms, but some synonyms for, for or the beginning, okay? The starting point, uh, gr ground zero, so to say. Uh, when we were tracing out 19, we got all the way back to the Wuhan lab in China and the market. That was ground zero, right? That was that was the origin. Um, we still don't know where that thing came from, do we? We still uh, we won't get we somebody does. We won't get into that tonight. But, uh, so the, the starting point, where it where it came from? Well, let's look in lesson two, page nine. The Lord's church is of divine origin. It originated in the mind of who? Of God. So who designed the church? God did. Who, uh, who sent his son to purchase the church with his blood? God did. Uh, so the church is, is God's plan. Now, our, I heard a preacher not long ago. He said there are no... Old Testament prophecies concerning the church. Is that, is, that, is that possible? Are there any Old Testament... Lesson two, why did I do that? Yeah, here we go. So, does the Old Testament talk about the Lord's church? Well, let's look at a few of these things. 
Yeah. Everything in the Old Testament did nothing to yes. the New Covenant. That which is better. In every way. I'm gonna I don't want to get too deep into this right here, but I do want us to kind of just just sample this a little bit. Um are we waiting on the kingdom right now? No. Is the kingdom present today? I think we can say it is. I think we I think we can say it is. Let's see if we can make some sense of that with scripture. Because Jesus came preaching and said, Repent, the word of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. Isaiah, we're talking about the Lord's church, page 9 under discussion. Prophesied and it should come to pass in the what? In the last days, yeah, that the mountain of the what? Lord's house shall be established. Well, what is that talking about? In the last days, how do we decipher that? That seems interesting. We find the, the same prophecy in Micah 4 almost verbatim. Hang on a second and we'll see if we can define that. According to 1 Timothy 3 and 15, what is the Lord's house? It's the what? I'm going to have to give y'all zero. The church of the living God? That's what I'm looking for right there. The pillar and ground of truth. That's exactly right. It's the pillar and ground of truth. Uh, so Paul is telling Timothy that. Now, uh, that, that phrase, last days, is used again over in Acts 2. Look at letter C. In Acts 2, when the Lord's church originated, Peter said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the what? In the last days. Well, wait a minute. What was prophesied by Joel was said to happen in the last days, and Peter said it was taking place there at Pentecost. I'm not a smart man, but can I say that the last days began with the church? We're living, those are the last, those, in other, when we say last days, we're talking about the final dispensation. We're no longer dealing with the patriarchal or the, or the mosaic of the patriarchal. We're dealing with the last dispensation, the church age. And God said that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Is that what we see in Acts 2? Sure. Sure, he poured out his spirit. And so this is what we are talking about, the Lord's church. Uh, now, when we're talking about that mountain of the Lord, what city are we referring to? In Jerusalem, right? The Lord's church. Oh, sorry. I don't know what I did, Brian. Can you go back to that? If you can't, that's fine. If So, so the church was prophesied about. It was foretold in the Old Testament, and it came into existence in the New. Yes, yes. It, they were. Where were they at when the church came into existence? What city? In Jerusalem, right? In Acts two, uh, all the all of the Jews from the earth had. Uh, made their way into Jerusalem because it was Pentecost. It was a, a Jewish feast, and so they would have all been there on this day. Yes, sir. When the sarcastic comment comes from the crowd, uh, man is wrong. Peter says, these men are not Jews. This is that which the prophet Joel. That's right, yeah. Yeah, they accused him of being drunk, and, and it's funny. Peter said, no, actually, this is from your own writers in, in the Old Testament that you read. Uh, this is a fulfillment of that. And so, look with me in number two, Roman numeral two, the Lord's church originated in the city of Jerusalem. The Messianic prophet foretold, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the what of the Lord? The mountains of the Lord, for out of what? Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so what, in Zechariah 8, 3 what city is called the mountain of the Lord? Jerusalem. So that's the city where the mountain of the Lord, where all of this would happen. We're talking about where this church began. Yes, sir, Brian. Yes. 
Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. And so it's important that we, we note that. And so uh, page 10, letter D up there, third one down from the top, in Acts 2, when the Lord built the church, the Bible says they were, th and there were dwelling at where? Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And so it's in Jerusalem that this, uh, this experience took place. The Lord began to build his church. And so it was in Jerusalem that they obeyed the gospel acts too. When I, and I don't mean to use that term. That's, sometimes that can be insider lingo. We don't always understand that. When they were baptized and became Christians, uh, they, uh, they were in Jerusalem. So, the Lord's church originated in the lifetime of some disciples. You know, I used to, uh, a better part of my life and ministry when I was preaching, I, I described to premillennialism. I taught that. I taught, uh, and I won't get into all that tonight, but there was one scripture that gave me a lot of trouble, and it's this scripture that I'm about to read you right here. I never could get peace about this scripture, and finally I did, but... Um, in Mark, this is uh, number three, letter B. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus told some people standing there, this is what a lot of people say, well, the kingdom is still to come. Well, verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall what? Not taste of what? Death till they have seen the kingdom. So we've got a problem. Either Jesus lied or we've got some really old people walking around right now. I mean, like 2,000 years old. Because he said, there's some of you standing here that you're not going to die until you see the kingdom. Does it make sense that there were some people still alive here and at Pentecost? Yeah. Who, who saw it? So, so what Jesus said makes sense. And, uh, and again, this author makes that point. If, if this isn't true, there must be some pretty old people roaming the earth. Uh, and I, I've, I, you know, I've tried a lot of ways as I study and preach to make that mean something else, but I, I, I can't. Yes, sir, Brian. That's right. Yeah, and so, and so, when we think about the church, and when I say the church, I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, I'm talking about the the saved of the world, those who belong to the Lord's church, Christ's church, the whole world over. It is to be viewed as a kingdom, a community of believers. And we're all living under the lordship of who? Of Christ. The, the church, if you will, is like a cosmos. Of, it, it's, a, it's in my mind, and sometimes I have things in my mind that I want to get out because I want people to get it, but I feel like no matter what I say, it won't paint the picture I want. It is a community of citizens who are citizens of heaven living on earth. The church is where, be careful when I say this, it's almost like where heaven meets earth. That makes sense. It, it, it's a foretaste of heaven to come. And so in this community, this church, we live under some very important laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, forgive one another. We're... We're living under that in this community of believers, and that's what the church is. The church is a foretaste of heaven on earth. That's not the fullness, but it should be a preview, and 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 that's how the church should be. Uh, I hope that I hope that makes sense. I, I sometimes I don't describe it very well. Anybody got any thoughts? Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. Right. Yes. That's right. Yes, both past and present Christians are citizens. You don't stop being a citizen of the kingdom merely because you have died. Uh, you continue to be a part of this kingdom. 
though in different a different location, uh, no doubt. But uh, did you ask what the press That's right. We're in. Look at Canaan. They could lose. Wasn't given when they went over there. We know God let them be driven out of the land. Sin. Yes. Show me no sin in heaven. That's right. Like when we sing this song, the Canaan land, I'm on my way. Canaan's the land of heaven. Yeah. Uh, basically, God's land is on the earth. Yes. We're living in the land. That's right. And if we keep the commandments. That's right. And, and and though we do live under this earthly authority, ultimately we are living under a heavenly authority, uh, which is King Jesus today, and we are citizens of his kingdom. Uh, now, there's another part. Anybody got another question? Okay. Uh, on page 10 there, Roman numeral 4, the Lord's church originated in the days of the Roman king. Now, again, we get kind of uh, off, off topic here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But uh, back in Daniel 2, uh, I don't have a lot of time. I really am hesitant to get off into this. But uh, back in Daniel 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and there was a great image, okay? And he saw the image, and uh, I'm not going to get too deep into it tonight, but essentially what he saw were world kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, under Alexander the Great, and lastly, the Roman kingdom. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, really worried. He's like, what does this dream mean? And so Daniel comes and tells him what the dream means. Uh, and he tells him uh, in letter D, uh, I'm sorry, uh, letter C, that these uh, in the days of these kings uh, refers to Rome. So, so Daniel essentially tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, in the days of these kings that you're dreaming about, God is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And what is the last kingdom in which God's kingdom would be set up according to that dream? Rome, the Roman Empire. And who was ruling during Pentecost in Acts 2? Rome. That's exactly right. So it, the prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, in fact, in Mark 1, letter D, Jesus says that at the time the Roman rule is fulfilled. He said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And so Caesar and the Roman kings were indeed ruling during this day, which is amazing to me because Daniel's prophecy was many centuries before, and yet uh, it, it was fulfilled with such accuracy. Yes, sir. I always do that through Revelation. When the beast comes out of the sea, it is an abomination to the Lord. And it rise in Daniel chapter 7. Yes. It simply is an abomination. All of them, yeah, absolutely. Are there any other thoughts? I know that's there's a lot there, but I don't I don't want to mar us down. I could dedicate an entire sermon to that, and maybe we'll do that one day. Um, well, uh, Roman numeral five, page eleven, and we're talking about the Lord's church. Where did it come from? When did it come? Well, the Lord's church originated after the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. Uh, remember in Mark 9 and 1, Jesus said, I say unto you, there'll be some that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with what? With power. That's right. And that power came through the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles on that day of Pentecost. Now, letter B, when the Lord assembled with the apostles, he said unto them, but you shall receive power after that the whom has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is come upon you. He empowered them with, the, with uh, what they needed to effectively preach the gospel. Uh, the Holy Spirit gave them power to perform miraculous signs uh, during this time as well. And so according to these two passages, letter C, the kingdom of God was to come with power, and the apostles were to receive power after the who came upon them? The Holy Spirit. Therefore, whenever the Holy Spirit came upon the apostle, apostles is when the kingdom came with power. Now, uh, on the day of Pentecost, letter D, the apostles were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's right. And so the kingdom, the Lord's church, originated with power. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. And so it was in this day. So we can... We can 
began, where it came from during this time. Any other thought? Yes, sir, Brother Mike. Yeah, okay. So we have two, two instances for sure in the text that tell us when the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened. We know it happened to the apostles. Uh, we, we, I guess we could also point to the baptism of Jesus when the, the dove descended upon Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then also uh, Cornelius as well in Acts the 10th chapter, the Holy Spirit fell. Who could give the baptism of the Holy Spirit oh, and, and who alone? God, that's right. Jesus said that he would do that. That's right. It can't be of men. It has to be from God. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. God has that power. Jesus reserved that power alone. Now, the apostles had the power, and I'm not going to get into this tonight, to go and lay hands on people and impart to them uh, certain spiritual gifts. You remember when they were... uh, uh, preaching in Samaria over in, in uh, Acts, the 8th chapter, I think. And uh, who did they call to come down to Samaria to lay hands on the converts? Peter and John, before Philip was called away. Yeah, so uh, the apostles had the power to lay hands. Now, the apostles did not have the power to give the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they did have the power to impart spiritual gifts through the laying on of hands. And we see Paul and others doing that. Yes, everybody. Yeah, that's right. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there were, there were other gifts given as well that were manifested. Yes, sir, brother. Yeah, that's right. The apostles, yeah, who were who were forwarding that gift, I guess. Yes. So, so let so uh, well, let's talk about it. First Corinthians thirteen. I've not got deep enough tonight, Miss Lynn. So just dive off in the deep end with me. Let's talk about First Corinthians thirteen a minute. Um. So. When we, when we think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, 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 were, that were bestowed upon people, uh, we see this right here. This is one thing that is very important to us. 1 Corinthians 13 and 8, Paul's talking about love and other things. And, and let me say this. This is a hotly contested verse, okay? I want to be very upfront. There are brethren even who differ a little bit on this verse, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hash it out the best I can. Charity never faileth, which is love, but whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now, when will all that happen? Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, but that which is in part shall be done away. Now, I know Paul sounds like he's speaking like a fortune cookie right here. Okay? Uh, but, but, But essentially, here's what Paul is telling us. When the apostles were present on earth, What did they not have that we have today? The the completed word of God as we have it today. And so they could not preach from a text like we can. And so men had to have some... So so if if Peter came on the scene and he said, I'm an apostle. And I would say, Peter, why should I believe you're an apostle? Well, he could verify through signs and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so because they were, at that time, the knowledge was in part. But when that which is perfect shall come. Now, uh, I, I tend to take the position this refers to the word of God, the completed revelation of God. Then those signs will, will not be necessary. Now, if we need signs today, um, 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So why, how do we believe the word of God? Because we have to have signs to believe it or we have the Bible, we have faith, we have, we have the recorded word of God. Yes. So I'm not looking for a sign today. I'm looking to the completed word of God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, for without faith it's impossible to please God. So when these apostles died, uh, it, it makes sense that uh, these gifts were for a, for a certain people in a certain period for a certain purpose. Over tongues, it they, they believe speaking tongues if tongues prove language. Yes. It's always viable. They call it the great gift. Yes. He tells them otherwise in chapter 14. He says that desire spiritual gifts are prophecy. He's telling them that you. In part, it's not complete. That which is perfect, that which is true. Yes, but when it does come, then, we won't need it. then there will be no need for these signs anymore. The Jews looked for a what? A sign. But but they no longer needed that when the completed word of God came. And so um, that's it's just something to think about. You know, I hope that's, I hope that's clear as money. Ponder a little bit there. Uh, and again, I admit, these, these are contested scriptures. Um, there are some brethren who take the position that that which is perfect comes is the uh, second coming of Christ. Now that's a, I struggle with that because of, uh, of what, I, what I just uh, it, it told you. Um, but we, we know that God used these gifts for a purpose and a place. In fact, when they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2, Every man that heard them understood exactly what they were saying in their own language. It was a miracle. It was, it was the equivalent of me going to a Hispanic man who spoke no English and talking just like this and him understanding exactly what I'm saying. In verse 6, it was noised abroad. The multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own what? Language. And there were men from all nations who were hearing it that day. So God was using this to get the word out to the entire world. But when that which is perfect has come, Paul said that there, these things had a time and a period and a place, but today we don't look for those signs because we have the, the word of God. Uh, Leonard and then Brian, and then I'm done. Perfect law of liberty, yes. Sure, yeah, the entirety of it. Yes, sir, Brother Brown. Yes. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Fathers 